Rocket Iron Mike's 100 East Chestnut, prime time with Mike North on Channel 62. And this guy has been broadcasting for the Chicago Cubs for 16 years. He worked with the legendary Harry Carey. But more importantly, he is a Cy Young Award winner. He's done it all, broadcasting, playing. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Stone! <laughs> my guy. Hello, Stoney. How are you, buddy? How are you? All right. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, let me tell you, first of all, we're taping on Wednesday night. Yes. This will be shown Friday. It's being shown right now, 6.30. Are the Cubs right now 0-2 or are they 1-1? Well, right now, the only thing I can tell you is they're 0-1. I understand that. And uh, when this is shown, if I knew how strong Kevin Tapney's arm was at this point, mm -hmm. I could be able to tell you. I know he's a great competitor. I'm not sure what he has left. The last two times, although he didn't win, what I was uh, noticing was he was getting the ball up. He hasn't done a great deal of that. That shows me that he's tiring. So I hope he's strong enough to put one together, because if the Cubs can steal one in Atlanta, they're going to come back here in pretty good shape. Yeah. Uh, do you think, though, if they are 0-2, that Kerry Wood will go on Saturday? Or do you think they'll pitch Mulholland? If I'm 0-2 coming back, mm -hmm. I don't risk Kerry Wood. Right. I pitched Terry Mulholland for the simple reason that I want to turn Chipper Jones around. I want to take Klesko out of the equation. I want to take Tucker out of the equation. Well, Holland can do that. All right, as far as this ball club is concerned, I looked at a team, the Atlanta Braves, that said, you know what, we got a shot at the World Series. I looked at the Cubs, they struggled all year long to get to where they're at, but they did. And I look at the team that said, hey, we made the wild card. That's the difference I saw between the two clubs in game number one. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as this team's concerned, the Chicago Cubs, if they continue to lose, and let's say they get knocked out of the playoffs, I remember what happened after 1984, as you did. I remember what happened in 1989, after 1989, where it took a long, long time to get back on their feet. Do you think that same scenario could happen next year with this ball club? Well, this is a team, there's no doubt. It, it's very similar to 84 and 89, where they took a knockout punch. Mm -hmm. It wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. They were top heavy in 84 and 89 with veterans, the same way the team is now. And when it wasn't good enough, what they didn't do was go back in the next year and retool once again. They don't have a real thick farm system. So there's not going to be a lot of help coming up. There's not another Kerry Wood down there. There's a Kyle Farnsworth. He's not going to be Kerry Wood. So I don't think they're going to look for a lot of help from down there. If they don't make it this year, they're going to have to take a look at their ball club and add something to it. They need two starting pitchers, I'm pretty sure that. <clears throat> when you look at next year, you got Jeff Blauser coming back, Lance Johnson. You got a Mark Clark decision. Mark Clark is making more money than Kevin Brown. I'm not sure if they want to pay him over five million next year. You know what, Kerry Wood? Do you think this could be an ongoing problem with this kid because he rips that curveball? You were a pitcher. I don't know how many arm problems you had if you had rotator cuff problems or anything like that. But do you think that this is going to be a yearly thing with Kerry Wood, where uh, around maybe July? or August, he might start having arm problems because he really breaks that curveball off. I can't look ahead at the future, I don't know. I know that uh, John Smoltz, with very good velocity, seems to have some elbow problems also. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that Kerry Wood, as far as uh, his arm is concerned, maybe it's a growth process. He's going to come back and everything's going to be good. Uh, I hope that he grows out of this. If it is a continuing problem, then it becomes a continuing problem for the Cubs. I'm not smart enough to look ahead and tell you that he's going to be great or he's going to stay healthy. I will tell you that if he stays healthy, he's going to be one of the best pitchers that the Cubs have ever seen. Randy Johnson, okay, he loses the other day 2-1. to one. Did you believe the scenario that the Cubs painted that, hey, you know what, <clears throat> we put our best foot forward, we offered him a deal, they didn't like what we had, we didn't have enough for him, so we couldn't swing it? Or do you think that maybe they should have sweetened the pot? I noticed Bramp Brown didn't play a whole lot the last month of the season anyway. Maybe they could have thrown him in. Do you think they could have done more to get Randy Johnson? Well, I don't think you necessarily needed Randy Johnson to get over the top. I think you had to prioritize. If Randy Johnson was your first choice, 
that's fine. Mm -hmm. If you don't get your first choice, maybe your second choice is Roger Clemens. If you don't get him, then you look at Pete Harnish. I think for a lot less, you could have had Pete Harnish, not at the trading deadline because Cincinnati had already signed him, but maybe a week and a half or two weeks before the trading deadline, before Harnish signed his extension, you probably could have had Pete Harnish if you went and talked to Jim Bowden and said, look, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to give you 150% for 100%. Pete Harnish is a guy that I want. He puts us over the top. None of that happened. Did they come in second for Randy Johnson? Are you asking that? No, I don't believe that. I'm not sure they were really ever in the Randy Johnson thing. The scenario that came out, they said we didn't match up with them. And quite frankly, we probably didn't match up because we didn't have Carlos Guillen to mm -hmm. give them. But don't forget that the first thing that Jerry Hunsinger was asked for was Scott Ellerton, the six foot seven right hander right. that we saw, and Richard Hidalgo. And he went, I'll get back to you. By the time he got back to him, it was about 10 to 12, and he said, Woody, it comes to my attention, you still got Randy Johnson. Now, let me tell you who I'm going to give you. It's not going to be Ellerton, and it's not going to mm -hmm. be Hidalgo. It's going to be these three guys, Halama, Garcia, and Guillen. You got nobody else to go to. There you go. You know, we're going to get back to you in a little bit, Steve, because we got to take a break. We're live at Iron Mike's, 600 East Chestnut. Tom Disco's prime time with my door. Back after this. Disco's prime time with Mike North, live from Iron Mike's right here on Channel 62. Our guest, Steve Stone. And Steve, you know what? You're like a mystery man. I mean, you've been in this town for a long, long time, but it seems like not too many people know anything about you. So I think this is a great opportunity. First of all, we know you're a bachelor. Yes. Is this confirmed forever? You're going to be a bachelor, no, you think, forever? No, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the girl on the white horse. That's what I've always said. And, um, you know... That's I thought it was supposed to be the guy on the white horse. No, 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 it's the girl on the white horse. Now, as far as you... It's been said before it was the guy on the white horse, right. but it's really the girl You're on the white horse. You're waiting for the girl yes. on the white horse, right? Yes. As far as family and stuff, you grew up where? Cleveland, Ohio? I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. My mother passed away. Uh, my father is remarried. I have a sister who lives in Denver. Uh, I have one nephew, Sam. He's six. Uh, he found an alligator right across in the pond in Washington Park in Denver. Got on the news, was his first television exposure. I was very happy with him. What was an alligator doing there in Denver? Nobody knows, they haven't found him yet. But, so that was it. Uh, you're known as a savvy businessman. Uh, you got involved way back when with Rich Melman and the guys from Lettuce. Uh, you're in the restaurant business now. Uh, what are some of the places that you have? Uh, what, what interest do you have? Well, probably the best thing I ever did was get involved with Richard. He is far and away the best restaurateur around. Uh, I'm involved with him in individual places here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I have a few places in uh, Arizona, one in Denver. Um, I'm selling one coming up here in a few days. I sold one uh, right when the season started. Uh, if you'd like to buy one, I'll be more than happy to sell hey. you some of the others. Uh, a restaurant, for the most part, is like a boat. The happiest days are when you open them and when you sell them. So uh, in between, you have a lot of heartache and a lot of aggravation. And when they're good, they're very good. When they're bad, they can be terrible. I haven't had any problems with the Rich Melman run restaurants. The boys from Lettuce Entertain You are exceptional. And of course, as we know, they've not only dominated Chicago, but a lot of other cities also. I remember when you pitched for the White Sox, I saw you at Jimmy Wong's, the old restaurant on mm -hmm. Peterson Avenue. Uh, I was with my wife. We were dating at the time. And some guy says to me, hey, there's Steve Stone. I said, he sucks. And I told my wife, <laughs> I told my wife B, I said, he sucks. The guy he grooves pitches, you know, he's not overpowering, this and that. And then you get traded to Baltimore later on, and you win the Cy Young Award, and B comes in one night, we're watching you on TV, I believe it was the World Series, and she goes, mm -hmm. wasn't, it, wasn't that the guy you said sucked? <laughs> what happened, what happened from the White Sox and the Cubs experiences to get you the Cy Young Award in Baltimore. Well, first of all, I went 12 and eight with the Cubs in 75. Which is like being a Cy Young Award winner. Well, at that point it was. They offered me a $2,500 cut. I tore up the contract, sent it back, became the first Cub free agent. That was the one year that Salty Saltwell went from hot dog vendor to general he manager. He was my boss when I was a vendor, and then the next Ter year we go, we're Salty. Right. He's the GM. Terrific guy. Anyway, I wound up leaving the Cubs. One thing you forget, for two years, 77 and 78, I led the White Sox staff in victories. So when I went to Baltimore, 
I was a fairly established pitcher, and they were a great team. In 79, we won 102 games. In 80, we won 100 games. I got my opportunity with them in 80, and things turned around for me, and, and it's just, it was a very good, solid baseball team. But it's funny you bring up Jimmy Wong's, because that same night yes. that, that someone said to you, there's Steve Stone over there, the same waiter came up to me and he said, you see that pasty guy over there? That, that's Mike North. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah. I said, you know, does he work at a hot dog stand? I don't know, but God, he's with a really nice looking woman. It'll never last. The guy's a slug. It's 21 years. 21 years. 21 years. years. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Thank Kate. you, buddy. 21 years. <laughs> I have to read books on the outside just to keep up with that woman, I'm telling you. Well, hey. she's lovely, and, and she must have very bad eyesight. Oh! Oh! You used to have, as a ball player, quite a stable of young beauties. Yeah, but you know what happens when you take the uniform off? Gone, right? Duh. Exactly. Nothing? They don't even want to talk to you. Oh, come on. Oh, it's, it's come my, on. It's my, I get letters. Will you please give this to Mark Grace? <laughs> we, yeah, please, you know, here, you know, I, I think you're a wonderful broadcaster. You know, you're the best. And I remember when you pitched and you were great. And could you do me a favor? Could you give this to Mark Grace and have him give me a call? I mean, that happens, you know, a hundred times a year. We're going to take a break. When we come back, <laughs> we'll have more Steve Stone. Live, Tom Disco's prime time at Buck Dogs. Bob Iron Mike, back after this. <laughs> Prime time with Mike North on Channel 62 Live from Iron Mike's right on 100 East Chestnut. Steve Stone, our guest, and we got to talk about Harry Carey. I'm sure you've answered a million questions this year about him. Uh, Harry was a friend of mine, and he was a great friend of yours. Uh, I thought the most remarkable thing about you two guys was the chemistry. Uh, Harry Carey was one of these guys that liked to be the show, but you always got your airtime. And I hear other guys like Chick Hearn, he works with Stu Lance. Stu Lance is lucky if he gets a word in edgewise. Did this start off right from the beginning, or did it take you guys a year or two to get things together? No, I think we had a, a pretty good chemistry right at the beginning, and when I got to WGN, the only criticism Harry had of me in that first year was, he said, you know, I've got to humanize you more, because I came over from the network. A lot of people don't realize I spent two years with ABC Monday Night Baseball, right. and the first guys I worked with were Al Michaels and Howard Cosell and Bob Euchre, and Don Drysdale and uh, Keith Jackson. So when I got to WGN, it was a much looser broadcast. And of course, Harry was the loosest guy you'd ever want to see. Right. So he says, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to humanize you to, uh, to our fans. And one day, I just was smoking a cigar for whatever reason. And that's, he said, he said at first he said, I don't know, but it'll come to me. I'll think about it over the winter time. Now this was 1984 and he started early in the season. The game was a blowout and he started with you know, how can a college-educated guy like yourself be smoking that stinking, ugly, terrible, foul cigar? And that started, you know, the thing that we had Boy, as a running Boy, that cigar bit. really smells, Tony. <laughs> but, you know, in 84, I was getting 200 cigars a week sent to me from all over the country saying, you know, here, blow this at Harry, see how he likes this one. Some of them were good, some of them were from Vermont. Uh -huh. Not a great cigar state, you know, but what the heck. Vermont but, cigars, uh, yeah, can't yeah, beat them. can't beat them. So, uh, it worked out really well in 84 was a magical year for the Cubs and uh, we had quite a time and I think the relationship grew but it took on almost the dynamics of a marriage and you have to bear in mind that after 15 years we were together longer than two of three of Harry's marriages <laughs> only Dutchy only Dutchy lasted longer than I lasted with Harry um, did you guys argue did you oh, guys ever have bad arguments but, off the air we had arguments everywhere we had arguments we had arguments in a limousine after they clinched it in 1989. About what? Doug DeCenzo. Uh-huh. He says, you're like, he says, Doug DeCenzo could start for any team in the National League. And we were drenched in champagne. This was mm -hmm. after the celebration. Mm -hmm. We had clinched it, and, you know, Mitch Williams jumping off, off the mound. Jim Dowdle, me and Harry in the back of Harry's limousine. He goes, Doug DeCenzo could start for any National League team. I go, are you crazy? The guy's a jockey. I said, he can't, he can't hit, he never bunts, he doesn't walk, he's two feet tall, he's maybe a four or five outfielder. Isn't he still in the league, by the way? No, 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 no. He's, I think this Who's is the other little Cangelosi. guy? Cangelosi. Oh, okay, Cangelosi. Yeah. I think they're brothers. It's close to it. No, right. you can't, you've never seen him in the same room no. together. But, um, <laughs> I, he says, you just like everybody else, you'd never give him a chance. I said, Harry, I'm a broadcaster, what am I going to give him a chance to do? I got no, ch I got no job for him. Anyway, it was one of the arguments like Harry would get into. 
Harry, unlike other people, some people jog, some people work on the Stairmaster, some people play tennis, some people... Harry argued for exercise. And that's how he got his blood up. And that's how, he got, that's how he got ready for every game. And if he didn't have an argument before the game, he would pick an argument about something that you... And, and he would argue both sides. Uh -huh. One day he would argue... He would argue your face off on one side of an issue. And the next day he would argue equally as most seriously the other side of the issue. He just loved to argue. Now you have a book coming out, I understand, I do. with Harry, right? It's called Where's Harry? Okay. And the reason it's called Where's Harry is that it didn't matter what I accomplished in my career, Cy Young Award, World Series, All-Star Game, whatever, restaurants, didn't matter. As soon as I became a Cub broadcaster, the first question that everybody asked me, where's Harry? Right. So I felt like having a t-shirt printed up so I could just go like this. How the hell should I know? <laughs> uh, because they thought we lived together. We didn't uh -huh. live together. We didn't room on the road. And most of the time, nobody could tell you where Harry was. But that was the first question. And I think people are still asking it because nobody really knows where he is. Well, you know what? <laughs> nobody does know where Harry is, but he was one heck of an entertainer. What did you learn from the man? I learned a lot of different things, Mike. One of the things I learned was that when you come to the ballpark every day, uh, it's more than just a job. He greeted every day like it was Christmas. Every day he got a chance to call a Major League Baseball game, to him it was very exciting. Mm -hmm. I learned that you have to have your enthusiasm up on a daily basis because the man at home watching the game is very enthusiastic about that game. And it doesn't matter where the Cubs happen to be at any given time. Harry told me many a time, he says, when they're bad on the field, we have to be better in the booth. We have to give the fans a reason to keep tuning in to WGN. I learned that. I learned a lot of things about Harry. I learned how to be a salesman. Harry was the greatest salesman of anything. If you had a product to sell, especially if it wasn't good, Harry was the best man to sell. And, and that's what he did. I mean, Harry almost got bigger than the game. And he always told me one thing. He said, remember something about baseball. The names change. The faces change. The game will never change. The game is the greatest thing that we have. And we have to make sure that it's always done for the fans because the fans are what makes it a great game. All right, we're going to be back. we got more to talk about. we got some selling to do. We come back. Tom Disco's <laughs> prime time with my boy. We'll Steve Stone back after this.